those claims. Now, in the next slide, you can see something that really should give all us political activists heart. When the FDA tried not only to just deny um, vitamin manufacturers the ability to make claims, but actually started getting pretty aggressive about working with them and trying to say that all nutritional supplements had to go through the development process, <laughs> um, there was an outcry from the public, uh, which actually resulted in the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, which was passed in 94. Congress got the largest citizen response they ever had. People who take vitamins really know about liberty, in that sector at least. They should be prime targets for us. They hate the FDA. <laughs> and this was passed, and what it does is it categorizes supplements as food, not drugs, and that means that the FDA can't push them through the drug process. But this is actually being threatened, as shown in the next slide. There is actually an international harmonization effort underway called CODEX, which is a joint product of the United Nations, so World Health Organization, and Food and Agriculture Organization. And they're developing these guidelines through the, the WTO, the World Trade Organization. And they've already been adopted in Germany, and the EU is being pushed to adopt them. Now the next slide shows what these regulations do. They limit the amount of vitamins that you can buy without a prescription. In Germany, if you go over these amounts, you've got to get a prescription. You've got to go see your doctor. Now, any of you who take vitamins in this uh, in this room know how crazy this is. I mean, vitamin C, 225 milligrams. Linus Pauling took 10 grams a day, 10,000 milligrams. Okay, I take about 2,000 milligrams a day. 4,000. Yeah, 4,000. Vitamin E. Uh huh. A lot of us take around 800 international units a day because that's what's been shown to prevent platelet aggregation, the initiating event in heart attacks. So you can see that limiting these things is going to have a big impact on health. And in Germany, it's already there. Now, in the next slide, we can see what Ron Paul's doing about this. I really love this. HR 2117. He didn't get to talk about this much when he was campaigning. But basically, this Health Freedom Act allows vitamin manufacturers to make claims as long as there's, unless there's absolutely nothing, no scientific evidence to support them. So basically, he's saying, unless there's a study out there that says that these things really aren't doing anything, you cannot take them off the market, you can't call them drugs, you can't regulate them. Now, of course, even if this passes, there's going to be a battle between Codex, which is going to be imposed internationally, or at least that's the hope, and what we do in our own country. But I love that Ron Paul is bringing this up and talking about it, and I hope he gets a chance to talk more about it, because it hasn't gotten quite enough attention in my mind. I'd like to sum up in the next slide a little bit, just talking about that this actually, again, applies to all health care regulation. I've only shown you, I only have time to show you one little part. But all these kinds of things happen in the healthcare industry and other parts of the healthcare industry, and those of you who are physicians, nurses, uh, physicians assistants know this well. It's, it's really the major cause of high healthcare costs. It hurts more people than it helps, and it's resulted in healthcare rationing, especially when the government pays the bill. And I'm going to give some examples in the next slide because it's coming to us. Obama's stimulus bill has a little part that says that there's uh, going to be monitoring of the cost effectiveness of our personal medical treatment. And what's happened, whenever government has done that, there's been health care rationing based on limiting care to the elderly, elderly and infirm. Now, I know there's a lot of people who have been active in the Libertarian Party most of their life sitting in this room, and elderly is where we're headed. So this applies to us. And for example, in Britain, and I think these are mostly, oh, I think they're, uh, I don't know about the hip replacement, the other two are British examples. Um, you know, you now have to go blind in one eye from, you know, from this macular degeneration before you can get the pharmaceutical drug that will prevent it from happening. <laughs> yeah, got to be blind in one eye before it's considered cost effective to save your other eye. Yes. Mm -hmm. And kidney dialysis, if you're over 50 in Britain, you have a one in three chance of getting kidney dialysis. They do not want to give it to you because 
they're getting a little old and you know not as productive anymore and they've got to do some kind of triage Ugh. yeah hip replacements yes um, young people are more likely to get cosmetic types of, of treatment than an elderly person is is likely to get a hip replacement in some of these places that have socialized medicine in fact Oregon actually created a cost effectiveness list like this and got a lot of flack now they've recreated their list and they're still getting flack because now of course a lot of the elderly people and what they need are being moved down the list and in most socialized countries you are not allowed to go buy your own health care so it means going out of the country so this is very very sad now the next slide shows another citizen effort to change this. This is the Abigail Alliance's suit. And what they did is they said terminally ill people have a constitutional right to buy drugs after they've been safety tested, but before they've been tested for effectiveness. And this is a group of cancer patients, mostly. You know, they felt they couldn't wait either, just like the AIDS patients, but they wanted to make it legal. So they brought suit against the FDA. And initially, they didn't get a very good response, but they finally got one court to rule for them. And of course, the FDA appealed. The court found against them. And they took it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court refused to hear it. So the lower ruling stands. There is no such constitutional right as a right to save your own life by buying drugs from manufacturers, even if they're not fully tested. So. You may, you know, your disease may kill you uh, before the drug is available, but at least you'll die safe. Oh. <laughs> one can only hope one of those Supreme Court justices gets the disease that they uh, just ruled against. Uh, well, if they did, I imagine that there, there is a program in place that the FDA touts a lot about compassionate use and expanded access, but try to get it. <laughs> but if you're a congressman or a judge, I bet you that you would have that drug pretty quickly. So, this is very sad that they didn't win this. So one of the reasons they didn't is that the FDA and its appeal said this would destroy the drug development industry. It would, it would create havoc. We wouldn't be able to enforce the Kefauver Harris amendments. Yeah, that would have been okay. Yeah. Life. What it would have meant is life. We're talking here about a matter of life and death. This isn't about a few more taxes. This is about your right to live. That's what this is about. And that's why I put the next slide and the final slide in here. You know, I am the chair of a private IRB in the Austin area. An IRB is an institutional review board. By law, any pharmaceutical company that wants to do a clinical study has to get a group of people called an institutional review board to look at their protocol before they do the study and make sure all the subjects are protected some of the things we have to make sure that the drug company is doing is fully inform the people who are in the study. And then we have to make sure that the people can easily opt out of the study at any point in time if they don't like it. And we also have to protect what we call vulnerable populations like terminally ill people. If the Kefauver Harris amendments were proposed to our IRB as a protocol that the pharmaceutical firms wanted to do, we would have to say it's unethical and it cannot be done. And yet, it is the law of the land that puts these unethical regulations in place. Now, you might say, where does this attitude come from? It came from the Nuremberg trials. When the Germans experimented on human subjects, people said enough. We want to be sure that people who are experimental subjects, even if they're volunteering for the benefit of mankind, are going to have certain rights and they're going to have certain information. And ironically, it's part of my job to make sure that happens when it's a pharmaceutical study. And I think it should be my job to help it happen for everyone. Thank you.